Good evening, everybody. Thank you so much for coming to the uh, Ian Beveridge Lecture. Uh, it's wonderful to see you all. Uh, my name is Jacqueline Norris. I'm the Dean and Head of School of the Sydney School of, of Veterinary Science. Uh, so before we start, of course, I'd like to uh, do an acknowledgement of country. So today, um, I'd like to acknowledge and pay my respects to the Gaddi people uh, on whose lands we meet, the, tr uh, the traditional custodians on this land. Um, it's of course upon these ancestral lands that the University of Sydney is built. Uh, it's its own postcode here, so pretty uh, extensive lands. Um, acknowledge the Gaddi people who for tens of thousands of years cared for this country and shared their traditional knowledge on our land and plants and animals. And evidence of that custodianship um, is very evident in our Australian landscape. Uh, and the animals are etched on the rocks. There's animals and fish and other things on our beautiful, the most beautiful harbour in the world, you'd have to say, Sydney Harbour. So these images of fish and kangaroos and birds remind us of the heritage and inspiration and learning. So today, of course, we strive to understand and care for our environment and to protect the health and well-being of its animals in our veterinary school. And that's our, um, one of our core missions in doing that through research and through teaching. So as we share our knowledge, teaching, learning and research practices within the university, uh, we also pay respects, of course, to the knowledge embedded forever within uh, Aboriginal custodianship of our country. Uh, today, of course, uh, we are on Gaddy Land. Our other campus of our school is the Camden campus, which, of course, is Dharawal Land. Um, uh, the painting that I've chosen there uh, is by Rebecca Beetson. So she's a famous um, Indigenous artist, and it's called The Joining of Two. And really, today, we're the joining of many and of, of thought processes and uh, disciplines and, and other things. So before I introduce our speaker, Dr. Alison Peel, today, I'd like to just to uh, invite you into why we uh, commemorate uh, Ian Beveridge every year through this uh, lecture. Uh, he actually was a graduate of this school in 1931, so considerably long time ago, uh, when it was a faculty of veterinary science. And what he demonstrated through um, you know, advances that he, his research uh, showed through uh, sheath rot in sheep, uh, foot rot in sheep. So he was the person who discovered the bacteria that's one of the causes or the main pathogen involved in, in uh, foot rot, uh, Bac Bacteroides nodosa. He's also instrumental in discovery and understanding around influenza viruses. He um, actually founded the Cambridge Veterinary School. So that's quite ironic since our speaker tonight uh, did her PhD there, so that's a, a wonderful connection there. And, and at the Cambridge Veterinary School, he was a professor in an, uh, animal pathology there. He did work on nomenclature and classification of cancers in domestic animals. Um, for the World Veterinary Association, he was the chairman for 18 years, so a very industrious person. Um, there's a couple of really interesting books that he wrote, one of which is The Art of Scientific Investigation. And if you can get over the, the, the constant use of pronoun he all the way through, that he did this and he did that, um, then it's actually really very, very insightful for its time. So one of the, the terms and the philosophies that he uh, brought forward was this concept of one medicine. Now it's had different iterations over the last decade or so, uh, one health, planetary health, other things. But it's this concept of a multidisciplinary approach to a really serious problem. And so, you know, that's where our speaker today exemplifies that. Um, so our speaker today is um, Dr. Alison Peel. And she uh, is a veterinarian who graduated from this veterinary school. Uh, and she uh, calls herself also a wildlife disease ecologist. So she's using her veterinary skills um, in the understanding around wildlife disease. So in particular, how human environmental impact 
ecological change and climate cycles contribute to the emergence of, of ongoing spillover of viruses from bats. As I mentioned before, she did her PhD at Cambridge um, and subsequently she now works on the, the, the litany is probably the wrong word, but the community of viruses that, um, that our, uh, our Australian bats um, harbour. So welcome, Alison, to the stage. Okay, uh, so thank you very much, Jackie, um, for inviting me to speak today. It's an absolute honour to, to be here and to um, and I appreciate also the being hosted here at Sydney Uni this week. It's great to see some um, familiar faces around and, and be back in my old uh, stomping ground. Um, thank you all for, for coming along tonight. Um, it's great to see so many people here. Uh, I'd also like to acknowledge the Gadig people of the Eora Nation whose unceded lands that we're on today as well as the traditional custodians of all the lands on which uh, my research has been conducted uh, and to any First Nations people here as well. I pay my respects to elders past and present and um, thank them for taking care of uh, these lands and its wildlife so that we're fortunate enough to, to share with them now. Okay, so um, all of the work I'll be uh, presenting tonight is a, uh, the product of a sort of extensive, extensive multidisciplinary uh, collabor collaborations here in Australia and internationally, um, and mostly as part of this BAT1 health team. So this is just a selection uh, of the many women and men um, that we've had working across five continents um, in field projects, lab and, and modelling studies. Um, the overall uh, lead for the project of Bat One Health is Professor Raina Plowright, who's based at Cornell University in the US. Um, I've been the main uh, PI, lead PI here in Australia, along with um, working closely with Dr. Peggy Eby, who um, I'll introduce in more detail later. Um, I'll also shout out to my some PhD students um, in the bottom left here and some Sydney collaborators um, in the bottom right. Okay, so you may be wondering what uh, Bat One Health even means. So, um, I will come back to the bat part in a moment, but first want to, to touch on One Health, and, and Jackie's given us an um, introduction, but um, discuss what it, is it, why is it important, um, and yeah, and obviously the, the legacy that it's, um, has been left by in Beveridge, um, and the you know, core topic of that, the um, talk, lecture series um, tonight. So One Health has been defined many times, um, but most recently as this uh, integrated unifying approach that aims to sustainably balance and optimise the health of people, animals and ecosystems. Um, Recognising, of course, that they are all um, very uh, closely linked and interdependent. So it's not a new concept in, in any means. It's in, entirely con consistent with the um, long-held Indigenous knowledge on the complex interrelatedness of, of life on, on land. And, but the, uh, the COVID pandemic really drove a um, renewed urgency to embed the frameworks of One Health into um, policy and action. And so the UN formed um, this quadripartite One Health High Level Expert Panel, or OLEP, um, and uh, involving the World Health, Health Organization, the Food and Agricultural Organization, the UN Environment Program, and the World Organization for Animal Health. And so the, the formation of um, OLEP really is a recognition at those highest levels that um, these One Health approaches are, are going to be critical to uh, tackling some of the um, poly crises that are facing us um, uh, and, and humanity in terms of climate change, biodiversity loss and um, emerging pandemic threats. Okay, so that's One Health, why bats? Um, so we have various examples of, of bats, um, of, of viruses in bats that can be transmitted to people. Um, so we call these, um, this process uh, a zoonotic spillover, where spillover just means that um, transmission of, an, of infections from one host species to another. Um, and zoonotic is where um, that transmission occurs between a non-human uh, animal and, and towards people. So in this case, from bats to people. This spillover often occurs through bridging animal hosts, um, and so these hosts may be perhaps more likely to be in contact with the, the bat populations and be exposed to their viruses, and they can often act as amplifying hosts, and so um, excrete massive amounts of viruses that then maybe come into contact with people and increase the likelihood that a, that a human is subsequently infected with this bat virus. 
Several of the viruses here, we've got um, obviously the most recent SARS coronavirus 2, but um, the first SARS coronavirus, MERS coronavirus, Ebola, Nipah virus and Hendra virus, several of them have gone on to cause pandemics or, or certainly sort of um, large human mortalities. And it's abundantly clear that SARS coronavirus 2, COVID, um, is, is not going to be the last. And so um, there's obviously an um, interest in, in a focus in studying them further. So with this in mind, the World Health Organization uh, and its member states identified the need for some global agreements on, um, to strengthen and be better sort of fund efforts for pandemic um, and issue uh, prevention. And so that's um, reducing the likelihood that a, a pandemic will um, occur in the first place as well as preparedness and response. And that's so better, being better prepared to um, contain emerging infections before they circulate um, into, uh, you know, too far in the human populations and develop into full blown pandemics. So this uh, pandemic um, agreement is actually in its final stages of negotiation this week in, in Geneva, um, trying to get countries to, to come to some sort of um, reasonable agreements on, on where the money comes from to fund pandemic and, and certainly equity across um, uh, countries, you know, in, for future pandemics um, to try and um, avoid, I guess, some of the catastrophic failures that we saw with COVID and, and issues with equity across the world. Okay, so what kinds of actions might we, might we take under this banner of prevention, preparedness and response? Um, if we start with this uh, zoonotic spillover in the middle, uh, we can look at reactive measures. And so that's um, aiming to limit the spread of pathogens once they emerge in human populations. So these are things like um, developing laboratory diagnostics, um, so, you know, early surveillance in human populations, pre better preparing our healthcare systems um, for you know, surge capacity um, and developing vaccine technologies, for example. So this is where a lot of the focus and the, the funding has, has been, and it's obviously all you know, incredibly important. But there's a whole other side that's upstream of the zoonotic spillover um, that is, can be called primary pandemic prevention. So that's reducing the likelihood that that spillover event happens in the first place. So this is things like trying to understand the circulation of viruses um, within um, wildlife populations and the natural host, um, addressing some of those core drivers of emergence um, and undertaking sort of integrated um, surveillance, not just in human populations, but in, in the wildlife hosts and the other species that they might come into contact with. Uh, so this is something that um, this uh, um, OLEP um, group has highlighted is drastically underfunded and receiving, um, you know, insufficient attention um, and, you know, arguing, I guess, that this pandemic agreement takes that into account in more detail. Uh, and so that's something, I guess, that my, my research is also trying to address is to um, uh, use One Health approaches to generate the evidence to support some of these um, interventions and uh, that might uh, occur in this, uh, you know, primary pandemic prevention sphere. Okay, so if we take a look at what we currently understand about uh, the mechanisms uh, in, in um, zoonotic spillover. So we can think about broad, um, broad drivers of, of spillover and, and many of you may be aware that there's um, several studies that have found correlations between spillover of viruses from, from wildlife and land use change. Um, and so this is things like clearing forests or converting um, land into agricultural and, and urban environments. So generally these studies um, are based on sort of uh, associations when spatial layers of those land use changes, human populations, animal populations, wildlife distributions are overlaid. Um, and they're really helpful in developing hypotheses around the underlying mechanisms driving, you know, particular hotspots of where viral emergence might occur. But it's very rare to have the data to be able to investigate those, um, those mechanisms in more detail, um, you know, at the level of the individuals within the wildlife populations themselves. Okay, so this is a fantastic conceptual model that we, um, you know, we use really repeatedly, I guess, in, in our work as, as a framework to consider the mechanisms actually underlying that viral spillover um, from wildlife. And it was developed by Rainer Plowright and others, um, sort of published in 2017. So this um, framework uh, is, is that there's, um, there must be, there's a series of barriers that must be overcome for a pathogen to pass from a, a reservoir host species, so the animal that the um, viruses um, are, are circulating within naturally, to the spillover host species, the recipient of that, um, those new pathogens. 
And so to start with, the, um, the distribution of the reservoir host, uh, uh, the virus must overlap with that spillover host. Um, they must be, um, the reservoir host must be the sufficient density to support transmission and the virus must be present and then um, excreted from those viruses in a, a sufficient intensity that when a, a new host is exposed that they're able to be infected. First, the virus has to survive for long enough in the environment to, to come into contact um, with that new host. And the new host has to be exposed and the virus must overcome all the barriers that that new host has to prevent infection. So structural barriers and immune barriers and, um, and the immune system must fail to, be, to prevent that virus from replicating. And only then, um, when all those barriers are um, overcome, do we actually see the spillover occur. Many of these uh, barriers are dynamic in, in space and time though. And so if you don't have the, the data and the, the insights at each of these key layers, uh, spillover can appear stochastic and, and unpredictable. And so our team is really trying to understand um, the, all the processes happening uh, across these layers um, using models and empirical data um, as, it result, as it relates to viral spillover from bats. Um, and that's sort of including, you know, the ecology of the host, um, their interactions with the environment and, um, of course, the, the virus itself. Okay, so if we're applying this to, um, this framework to, to land use change, what are the mechanisms that might be underlying that association with spillover? So this is something that um, we explore in this new paper, which is actually being released later this evening um, in Nature Communications, uh, again, led by Raina. Uh, so if we start with um, healthy sort of ecosystems, we will know that animals will naturally have a distribution that supports their ecological and, and energetic needs. Um, and within those natural environments, there's a, a certain amount of energy that's available at any given time, um, you know, in, through food. And, um, and this can vary seasonally. And so that's sort of shown in the blue plot there. So in terms of the energy expenditure of the animals, they um, have baseline um, energy re um, expenditure that is required for, for um, daily uh, existence, so things like um, functioning their immune system and, and all their cells in their body. And then they'll have energetically expensive activities, things like um, movement and um, migrations and, and reproduction. And um, uh, wildlife will naturally, um, I guess, time those energetically expected um, expensive activities so that they coincide with peaks of um, food availability, energy availability. So the, the total resources that an animal requires at any um, given time can be called its, uh, its allostatic load and, and um, that's basically, you can think about that in terms of sort of an energy and, and stress budget. Under normal conditions there's usually a little bit of buffer within the system um, that provides a little bit of energetic wriggle room. Okay, so for, for bats, for example, even when they're, um, they're healthy and in natural um, systems and their uh, immune system is functioning well, there are viruses that circulate within these bat populations. They're often at viral, low viral loads. Um, and so even if they excrete um, the virus, if they're um, separated from uh, humans and their domestic animals, then, then spillover won't occur because that um, exposure doesn't, doesn't happen. So essentially in this case, the the holes in the barriers to spill over are, sp are small and they don't overlap. If we think about what happens with, uh, with land use change, this might inc include um, clearing of native forests or, or planting new potential food sources uh, amongst human populations and domestic uh, animals. And so if their primary energy resources are cleared, bats still need to find a way to, to meet their energetic needs. And so they're mobile species, they can move and shift their distribution or may alter their diet to, in order to obtain enough en energy. Um, and so, but over the time, this requirement for, for ongoing changes can cause um, chronic stress. So if we, if we look again um, at this figure, we can see on the right there now that that, that additional stress and the, the movement required increases the, the total energy that they require and it's pushing into that buffer available in the system. At its worst, it, um, with extensive land clearing, that buffer no longer exists and then more energy is required by the, the, by the bats than is available in the environment and the bats can go into allostatic overload. Um, so this can result in um, not enough energy for their the normal functions um, you know, and, and compromise things like their immune system and making them more susceptible to, to um, viral infections and, and increased shedding. 
Okay, so land use change is a double whammy. First, it um, generally increases the overlap of, of reservoirs and, their, um, and humans and their bridging hosts, not just in the areas where that habitat is being cleared, but um, where the bats have to retreat to, to survive. And secondly, it increases the probability um, that the um, reservoir hosts will be shedding virus and that that shedding virus will overlap with the, um, and uh, be exposed to the, uh, to the humans. And so in some, I guess these changes are um, both increasing this, the, the size of the holes in the barriers and increasing their alignment. Okay, so um, this month there's actually been a, a recent paper that's shown some very good evidence um, of, of this effect of allostatic load on, on viral infection in bats. So this is a paper on um, Marburg infections in Rosetta's bats, uh, where, uh, who are the natural hosts of, of, Marburg, infection, of Marburg virus. And, and so they uh, infected bats with, with Marburg virus and, and saw that the bats mounted a, a pro-inflammatory immune, immune response that largely controlled the virus, moderated the, the shedding, so there's very low amounts of shedding, and there are no clinical signs or, um, or really any subclinical pathology. So the bats deal with this virus as they would do naturally in the wild. With a second cohort of bats, they actually, at the same time they infected them with Marburg virus, they also gave them an injection of a, a sort of a, like a stress hormone, dexamethasone, um, at the same time. And they found that um, this, uh, so this dampens that pro-inflammatory immune response, and they saw this massively increased um, viral replication within the liver, um, sort of, uh, increased viral shedding, um, and over a, a prolonged period of time, quite severe liver pathology and even um, death in one of the bats. And so it seems like naturally these bats are sort of balancing uh, tolerance and resistance, but if we dampen down that resistance, then the virus can get the upper hand um, and the bats actually can get sick from, this vi uh, from their viruses. And so that's sort of challenging, I guess, a, a dogma that's out there that is, you know, bats have these viruses and they just don't get sick. So here this is a, um, a bit of a paraphrasing of, of one of the statements in the paper, but the authors say that these findings suggest a compelling scenario in which environmental stress could weaken immunity and precipitate supershedding events that enhance transmission and the risk of spillover to underprotected hosts, including humans. Um, so yeah, this is, I mean, this is a, a fantastic paper and really gives us some, some confidence in, um, in some of the mechanisms that we've been thinking about for a long time. Okay, so you might be thinking, okay, well, what's this lab study and, um, and all this theory got to, to do with real-life systems and spillover? And, and so with that, I'm going to turn to, to Hendra virus as a case study. So um, Hendra, uh, you know, it doesn't go to, on to cause uh, pandemics. Um, but when we think about sort of uh, bat viral spillover in general, the, the outcomes of that spillover can, can vary quite widely. So sometimes it can just result in a, a single infection or a, you know, a, a small local epidemic. And it's very rare that it sort of emerges into this um, global pandemic as we saw with, with COVID. So study into the event of that, um, that caused this pandemic, that initial spillover event is though often dwarfed by in some cases politics, but, but also the immediate sort of um, requirement for a public health response to, to deal with all the infections in humans. And so one strength of um, studying the Hendra virus system is that spillovers occur regularly um, and it doesn't cause um, ongoing human transmission. And so we can focus our investigations on the spillover itself without being consumed by the public health crisis. Okay, so, so Hendra virus, um, it was actually the first of the new emerging bat viruses when it um, emerged in, in Brisbane in 1994, 30 years ago uh, this year. So, it doesn't tend to make bats sick from what we can, what we can see, um, but uh, it does cause high fatality rates in, in horses and people. Over the last 30 years or so, a lot of the study on, on um, and a lot of the spillovers have happened in uh, southeast Queensland and, and northeast New South Wales. And within this area, we see, um, we tend to see a strong winter seasonality of, of Hendra virus spillovers. So, See my mouse here, but yeah. So this is sort of um, a heat spot showing, showing um, the winter seasonality. Um, but also we see this uh, interannual variation where we see some years of particularly elevated risk. And, and 2011 was one of those cases where there was a sort of a really large, um, unprecedented number of spillovers in a short space of time. 
And so, yeah, as I said, while it doesn't tend to cause ongoing transmission, um, it's spilling over regularly, annually, into horses, which are generally closely monitored, um, and we close contact in people, and so that we can, you know, get a fairly good understanding of when those spillovers are occurring. When we pair this with um, extensive long-term data sets on bat ecology and their natural habitat and, and climate, um, it actually gives us the opportunity um, to explore some of the drivers of this spillover process. Okay, so when it comes to this um, ecological, these ecological data sets, um, these, in this case, these were largely being collected and collated by ecologist Dr. Peggy Eby over, over 25 years or more, from 1996 through to 2020. Uh, so Peggy first got involved with Hendra in 2011 when there was that unprecedented number of um, Hendra spillovers. And um, it was already established that flying foxes were the natural host of, of Hendra virus. Um, and, and so a number of bat researchers were um, advocating and determined to see, um, see that an ecologist was um, attending those spillover locations to work alongside the um, veterinary and public health professionals. Um, and so, so really sort of taking that kind of uh, One Health approach. And so that person was Peggy. And so when Peggy visited these properties where the spillovers had occurred, she identified that the the flying fox behaviour that she was observing was unusual um, and that really, I guess, sparked a sort of, um, you know, an ongoing series of investigations um, to determine why, what, what was going on with these bats and why were we seeing this Hendra virus spillover. So um, this sort of had uh, culminated in this paper that we had published in, uh, in Nature last year um, that brought together um, a large number of empirical data sets on flying fox roosting ecology and foraging ecology, um, the flowering pulses and, and nectar shortages, um, measures of, of bat health, looking at ha um, habitat loss, climate, climate cycles, and of course the hendrovirus spillovers themselves. Okay, so if we look at um, flying foxes and um, their amazing ecology, um, flying foxes are, are nectivores and, and uh, seed dispersers like, like birds and, and insects, but they're able to, to do that over much broader areas because they're so highly mobile. The conditions in their environment are um, ch sort of changing constantly, and, and this is a, um, a map of southeast Queensland where the um, circles are showing flying fox roosts and they're fluctuating uh, in size over time as the flying foxes are tracking the resources across the landscape and, and feeding on flowering eucalypt species. Um, so flying foxes have a, a, a wide range of um, species that they'll um, feed on and so you can see in this map of Eastern Australia here um, showed by the red shading. Um, but during winter there's, there's only a very few um, number of uh, tr tree species that will flower reliably in winter um, and their, their distribution is much more restricted and so you can, you can barely even see the shading um, of where those winter food sources are. But when there is a good winter flowering, the bats will find it and they'll congregate into these um, uh, small areas, I guess, to, to feed on these highly productive food sources. And, and this is an example from 1998 where 92% of the grey-headed flying fox population were in this, um, this small area of southeast Queensland, northeast New South Wales. So if, if these, with these limited winter food resources, it's not hard to imagine that um, clearing and, and losing of these winter resources will have considerable impacts on, on bat ecology and their health and their movement patterns um, and overall, I guess, their, their allostatic load. In addition to the, um, the seasonal variation in food availability of flying foxes, there's also interannual variation. Uh, and so we know that in some years there can be um, com complete failure of flowering uh, in, their, um, in their diet species and a shortage of food. So this um, puts them again at risk of, of going into that allostatic overload and even and dying of starvation essentially. And bats are um, mobile over very large distances and so um, it can be really challenging to understand the conditions um, that they're experiencing within the landscape in any given time. But since bees are also using many of the same um, resources, Peggy's developed um, relationships with um, a large number of apiarists and so um, is able to gather data on the available res resources for flying foxes um, through, through those apiarists. And so these, um, within this, this study, um, through the apiarist data, we identified that there were nine um, sort of winter spring food shortages that occurred between uh, 1996 and, and 2020 um, and shown by the orange bars here. 
And we found strong evidence that these um, winter, uh, the, the food shortages were driven by a strong El Nino event. So every time that there was a strong El Nino event, which is shown by that green asterisk, there was a food shortage in the following year. I will say that there are, um, you will notice that there are a couple of food shortages there that were not preceded um, by the food shortage, and, uh, but, sorry, by the ONI um, El Nino events, but I'll, I'll come back to um, that in a little bit more detail later. Okay, we, we see um, that these food shortages have a clear fitness effect on flying foxes, and so this is um, notable through an increase in the number of bats that are coming into, into care, into wildlife rehabilitators, um, and so that's shown by the, the grey bars here over time. So there's, every time there's a food shortage, a lot of bats are um, uh, you know, suffering starvation and will be, will be called in by members of the public. Uh, we also saw um, that there are a, a, a fitness costs through rep loss of, um, in reproduction. So um, in, in usual years when there's no food shortage up in the, um, up in the top right, um, we can see that sort of upwards of 90% um, often of uh, female flying foxes will um, ha um, support a young through till weaning. Um, but when there is a food shortage, there's massive uh, juvenile mortality and the percentage of females will, with young drops considerably. Okay, so um, overall we've, we've seen, as I mentioned, that this um, climate is, is driving these um, acute food shortage of flying foxes and these food sh shortages are consistently having negative impacts on fitness of flying foxes. We also saw, though, that these patterns were shifting over time. So this is a bit of um, a schematic where um, the y-axis represents sort of the number of, of flying fox roosts um, uh, in a given area. Um, and, and normally we see sort of large numbers of um, nomadic populations, um, uh, you know, sorry, small numbers of roosts, um, but with large, large population sizes. And when there is a food shortage, those bats will um, fragment and spread, spread across the landscape looking for food. And so we see this, this uh, fissioning and a, a, a much larger number of, um, of small population size roosts. And so um, that's, you know, they're, they're um, fragmenting to, to look for food and avoid dying of starvation. But eventually that natural flowering will resume and the bats will come back to their nomadic um, movements. Um, this has been documented over, you know, more than 100 years and as a, as a natural process with the climate cycling. Um, so we saw that uh, in the initial sort of time series um, within our data that um, this was occurring, but the, the number of, the baseline number of roosts was stable over time and we didn't see any hindervirus spillovers at that time. But more recently, since about 20, uh, 2003, we saw that the baseline number of roosts increased threefold. And this was often in a stepwise manner um, associated with those food shortages. And, and so it seems like those bats, when they're fissioning, are not coming back to that nomadic um, movement in the same extent as they, they previously used to. We also saw during that time that there were um, 40 hendrovirus spillovers. And it's about three quarters of those were happening in clusters of, of three or more. Okay, so in a simplistic way, when there's, very f when there's a small number of large roosts, that means there's good flying uh, food availability in native forests, many small roosts indicate sparser food availability and the bats are having to search around for food. Okay, so in, in, as well as the increased number of roosts, we also saw a change in distribution of, of roosts in these time periods. So I won't go into these roosts in, in oh, sorry, in these maps in too much detail, um, but basically between these two time periods, we see a massive increase in the number of roosts shown by the, the yellow circles here, but also an expansion um, of the, these roosts and their foraging areas um, into more sort of, you know, a, a regional and agricultural landscapes that they um, hadn't previously been. We think that this fissioning um, is, is um, happening to kind of mitigate some of the um, energetic costs of, of foraging um, and, uh, and sort of the energetic stress. We also looked at habitat loss um, from far southeastern Queensland where the diet species that provide food um, for flying foxes in winter um, used to be extensive. Um, we can see in that in the pre-clearing map up in the, in the left. Um, but there's been an um, ongoing decline over, over time in these um, available resources and um, only about 20% of, of those um, winter flowering species remain. When we look at the, um, 
uh, bat populations within these initial years, we see that about four of those six initial years had very large populations of, of flying foxes, those nomadic aggregations, whereas more recently um, those nomadic large aggregations have largely disappeared from this area. And basically the, the habitat no longer exists to, to regularly support those kinds of large populations. Okay, so how does this link to, to Hendra virus um, spillover? So as with the Marburg study that I showed, uh, the laboratory study that I showed with you earlier, we've shown that the newly formed roosts in these, these new areas, which are um, shown in the grey here, they're um, outside that natural um, winter foraging uh, range and they're shedding um, Hendra virus at higher prevalences than in, in these more um, historic roosts here. We also see that in years after that food shortage, after that nutritional stress, that that, um, that excretion of virus is amplified as well. And so suggesting that these landscape um, stress is um, contributing to the Hendra virus shedding and spillover. So that's, uh, that was um, prevalence of Hendra virus. And, and now if we look at um, the, the spillover itself, this is a, um, a simplex plot where uh, each of the points represents a, a flying fox roost and its placement within the triangle um, depends on the proportion land cover um, within its foraging area. So um, dots down in this bottom corner are very highly urbanised environments. Environment, um, in, the, in the bottom left is um, a real, um, sort of forested environments and then up in the top is more open croplands. And so although a lot of these, those new roosts that I was showing were, were forming in this, um, this urban landscape, um, the, the spillovers are predominantly happening in that um, uh, in mosaics, sort of agricultural and, and forested landscape at low um, human densities. So presumably this is related to uh, where the horses are and the densities um, where horses are. And this is something that my PhD student, um, uh, Belinda Linegar, is gathering data to test because we actually have a very um, poor understanding of the numbers and the densities of horses um, in, in the landscape in Australia. So um, in the interest of time, I'll, I'll leave that to um, another a future presentation. But yeah, it's um, really important to have those data to be able to um, run our models. Okay, so um, bring together from that, um, that this big paper that I mentioned, we were able to use this a Bayesian network model to test some of the hypotheses we had about the connections between these drastic changes in, um, in flying fox ecology and, and distribution and the emergence of um, ongoing, um, and ongoing spillover of Hendra virus. So our models supported that um, if there was uh, a climatic threshold exists, which if it was passed, um, it triggered a food shortage in, in the following year. And then that food shortage triggers um, those flying foxes to distribute across the landscape and, um, and, and fission. Uh, and many of those um, new roosts are forming in, in agricultural areas. These factors together were combining to increase the risk of a cluster of Hendra virus spillovers in the following year after the food shortage. And so those associations are giving us a um, two-year advance warning of this increased um, uh, spillover risk of, of Hendra virus. One from the um, ONI threshold to the food shortage and then the, from the food shortage to the spillover. And, and so uh, in... Sorry. Uh, so, so that, yeah, increased spillover risk. But we can see that actually um, there's another factor that we, we're not able to predict at the moment in advance, and that's the, uh, the presence of these large flowering pulses. And so if there is a very good flowering pulse within the remnant ve vegetation that still exists, um, all, that high, all the factors that are leading to the high risk of um, spillover are, are cancelled out and um, the risk of spillover drops to near zero. So we saw in October 2023 that that um, climate threshold um, was passed. And so that would, um, based on our models, would lead us to predict that there would be a food shortage for flying foxes in spring of this year um, and the potential for a high risk of Hendra virus uh, spillover in winter next year. So that enables us to start uh, planning, I guess, our research studies and talk to affected co communities and think about risk mitigation measures. Okay, but these systems are complex <laughs> um, and keep us on our toes. And so you may remember that, remember that I mentioned earlier that sometimes those food shortages um, occur in the absence of that um, high El, um, El Nino threshold. And that happened in spring uh, last year in November. So we saw um, a food shortage occurring in um, northeast New South Wales and southeast Queensland. 
And our models would, would suggest that in, in the absence of a strong winter flowering pulse this winter, that this winter would also be an increased spillover risk uh, for hendrovirus. So um, this is something that, um, again, it's, it's very hard to have the confidence to, to predict something absolutely, but it's worth, um, I guess, being aware of these underlying mechanisms so that we can take actions. And, you know, if we're really effective in taking actions to pre prevent spillover, who knows whether we are right or not. <laughs> Okay, but we have these data that um, without, as I mentioned, we can't predict whether that flowering will occur, um, but we have these data from previous years to, to look at a finer scale of that, that impact of, of winter flowering. So this is a plot where each of the rows represents um, the three months of winter, where we have data on whether or not there was a large, large aggregation of flying foxes and, and productive winter flowering. So the dark grey represents where there's, there's good flowering and large nomadic populations. The light grey is where there was an absence of flowering or absent, uh, you know, insufficient to support those large nomadic populations. And the white is just where we don't have any data. So when we look at the, um, initially that, you know, uh, Early on in the time series, there was more consistently um, winters with, with good winter flowering than there are now. And when we look at the occurrence of spillovers, there were no spillovers occurring when there was good winter flowering um, during that winter. And so protecting and, and restoring this winter flowering and the protective um, uh, uh, effect that it offers us, it really has to be um, a critical task to, to prevent spillover in the future. Okay, and this, so it offers hope, I think, more broadly that sustainable solutions are out there to um, help prevent uh, bat viral spillover. And so uh, Peggy Eby, again, is, is working with various um, habitat restoration efforts um, to um, plant, uh, who are planting um, species, uh, sort of uh, habitat species and ensuring that they're the, the, the right species that can support, um, you know, flying foxes as well as a range of other species. And uh, she's also developed this Habitat um, Restoration Hub project, which is ho hosted on the uh, Atlas of Living Australia, ALA. And it will be the uh, world's first archive of restoration efforts that document um, what habitat restoration has been done um, and the details to help investigate whether it's been successful or not, um, what species have been planted, how long it takes the, uh, those plant species to come into flower, and eventually sort of document, um, enable people to document what, what um, wildlife species, I guess, are using those restored habitats. And so um, there's some indications that the, um, some of the flying fox diet species, like Eucalyptus robusta, are coming into flower within three or four years of being planted. And so these solutions of restoring habitat to prevent spillover may not be so uh, far away. Okay, so uh, coming back to this uh, conceptual model that our Bat1 Health uh, team are continually trying to fill in uh, ga gaps across each of these layers. Um, I've mentioned sort of this work in documenting uh, flying fox distribution um, behaviours. We're looking at um, smaller scale movements and behaviours through GPS tracking, uh, pairing that with diet data to better understand their nutritional status and uh, the potential drivers of, of contact with, um, between bats and horses. Just this month, um, we've begun undertaking a population using drones and high resolution radar system, which is um, capable of tracking thousands of bats simultaneously, in this case, where the, when they emerge from a roost. We've also done studies to, um, on how flying fox density um, varies within, and across, um, within roost across multiple scales, um, and how this contributes to um, potential viral transmission within roost. Um, as well as looking at viral intensity and, and prevalence, um, theoretical uh, explorations of how to um, account for imperfect viral detection, um, looking at virus survival using um, aerosolized viruses in, in um, PC4, sort of highly contained uh, laboratories in the, in the US. And, and finally, as I mentioned, sort of my PhD student looking at um, these lower layers of horse um, exposure populations, their susceptibility and detection of hendrovirus spillover. Okay, so um, before I wrap up, we're, you know, there's a lot of work focused on hendrovirus, but um, hendrovirus is not the only bat um, in, in flying fox populations, and we'd like to really know whether this approach and our understanding for hendrovirus is relevant to any of the other viruses that, um, you know, are circulating or, or may emerge from flying fox populations in the future. So for hendrovirus, we've got this um, broad understanding that um, you know, the environmental conditions and availability of food um, drives both the contact, of, um, but contact between flying foxes and horses as well as their viral load. 
So if we think about other viruses in the same system, we can assume, well, you know, we're still dealing with the same host, so the, the movement and the contact rate sh should be um, constant. So if we see um, differences in the temporal dynamics or viral load of other viral um, species, then um, we can sort of make inferences on whether these um, drivers are generalised or not. We have um, some evidence of this from, um, uh, this is a previous study of mine, um, from paramyxoviruses, so related viruses to Hendra um, that are circulating in Australian flying fox populations. And this is a, a, a plot from, yeah, that covers that um, 2011 period where there was a high number of Hendra virus spillovers. And all these different colours here um, represent different viruses. And we saw that, you know, they're dottering around, um, you know, at, at any time. But during this peak time of Hendra virus um, spillover, we saw a massive increase in the, in the shedding of all these other viruses at the same time. So this suggests that there's common ecological or population level drivers for this viral shedding, um, and therefore that if we take ecological approaches to solving it, um, then that we can um, address not only hinder virus spillover, but prevent emergence or reduce emergence of um, some of these other viruses at the same time. So that, that, um, that plot I just showed you then was done on a, a sort of older historical data set, but um, also over the uh, four year uh, period or so between 2017 and 2021, um, our Bat One Health research um, field team uh, did an extensive amount of field work here in Australia, over 60,000 samples collected from more than 260 sampling events across 26 sites and my mind still boggles when I, when I think of those numbers, it's a hu huge um, field effort. So we're able to, that all those samples were screened for Hendra virus, but we're able to leverage the availability of those the viruses for, for um, a broader study on viral community. So for the past two years or so, I've been collaborating, collaborating with uh, J.S. Eden um, and his team at Westmead Institute for Medical Research um, to leverage this, um, this database to implement a major genomics uh, program to investigate the broader viral community. We're part way through um, this sort of uh, three major phases of metatranscriptomic analyses um, to look at viral co-circulation uh, at a population level and then eventually dig down um, to get a, a finer scale to look at um, in virons of individual bats. And so this will enable us to rigorously test some of these assumptions about um, drivers of, of bat viral shedding and, and bat health and the relationship between bat health and spillover. This is still very much a work in process. These, are, um, these next few plots are, are pretty hot off the, of the press. Um, and so this plot shows um, the presence and absence of uh, unique viruses in, in urine and faeces by month across uh, 10 viral families. Uh, and within each row, each color is a unique uh, virus. So this is just showing presence um, and absence. Um, so we need to do some further work to look at prevalence and viral load, but this is just um, showing what's out there at any given time. And JSC um, is a PhD student, K9, uh, has been working hard to define each of the unique viruses so we can separate what's what. Um, and we're at a count of about a, um, 104 um, viruses, as I mentioned, across 10 viral families, and, and the vast majority of those are, are novel viruses and, and even not novel genera. We can see that, um, so on the, on the left is um, the viruses that we're detecting in, in faeces, um, and we can see that we're um, detecting a lot more viruses in, in urine, and that's likely um, because there's a lot less other genetic material in there from the, the plant species, the bacteria, um, you know, any insects that they may pick up, um, et cetera. Uh, yeah, and so, you know, at the moment, um, the, the, the viral genera that I'm showing here are, um, cover paramyxoviruses, uh, beta coronaviruses, astroviruses, retroviruses, and parvoviruses, and then a whole lot of others that are comped into other. Okay, so if we take a, look, a closer look at the paramyxoviruses, we're in the top there, um, there's up to 20 distinct paramyxoviruses circulating in a single month in some of our sampling. Um, overall, when we um, look at the family as a whole, we see a tendency towards um, winter or late, late winter sampling. Um, the dotted lines uh, show um, June, the beginning of, beginning of winter. Um, and we, saw, we see that there's sort of a, a general decline in, in diversity by year over our study period. So this was a year where we um, expected and, and saw a cluster of hendrovirus spillovers and we see this um, very high number of um, paramyxoviruses detected at the same time and a gradual decline over time. Um, 2020, we were also um, expecting there to be 
uh, a large number of hendrovirus spillovers. We saw one, um, but then a large flowering pulse occurred and, and um, we didn't see any more. So it would be really interesting to understand, I guess, how, how quickly those flowering pulses can, can come in and, you know, prevent uh, viral um, shedding across a range of different viruses, potentially. Okay, so um, I've got a PhD student, um, Brent Jones, who's going to be um, looking at these data in, in, um, in a lot more detail and, and down to the individual level and to be looking at what interactions there actually may be occurring. I mean, we talk about um, sort of complex ecological communities, well, that's happening in a viral level as well, and there are some instances where there's evidence for interactions between viruses themselves that may be um, driving infection. Okay. All right, so um, in terms of dig digging into in detail and, 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 and understanding um, the drivers, we've been able to look at that to some extent with um, uh, coronaviruses in, um, in these species. So in general, in Australia, coronaviruses are very poorly studied in Australian bats. Um, and in 2020, we started to, um, to, to look at this in more detail. And again, this was um, in association with a, a horses as sentinels group, which, um, of which uh, for example, Ed Annan was, was based here in the, in the vet school, um, and JS and others um, through the University of Sydney down at Camden extracting samples for us, and, and JS and his team, and Karen Kim, um, you know, so a big collaborative effort across um, different locations and, and disciplines. So we screened about, um, we, you know, my collaborators, <laughs> screen, screened over two and a half thousand um, samples that we'd collected and um, identified uh, six different coronavirus uh, clades that are shown in the, in the red in the phy phylogeny here. And these are in the um, no, Nobeca virus um, subgenera of, of coronaviruses. And so not SARS-like viruses, but um, a group of viruses that are, are pretty, pretty commonly detected in, in fruit bats in particular. Um, within this uh, phylogeny here, we can see that there's, there seems to be some, I guess, host separation. The, the, the red dots here represent the um, coronaviruses that are de detected in um, teropa species or um, flying foxes. Um, and, but there's sort of probably a little bit less sampling in some of these other species. And so we may be interesting to see with, with further sampling how, how much um, host differentiation, I guess, that we get across these uh, beta coronaviruses. Um, we've got this sort of interesting uh, wayward clade down here um, in Teropus that's amongst all these um, other Rosettus viruses and yeah, it would definitely be interesting to, to look into that one in a bit more detail. Okay, so there's two clades in particular, um, uh, what we call uh, clades four and five that are really interesting in terms of their dynamics, which I'll discuss in a moment, but also in terms of their placement here on the phylogeny they're not that closely related to each other, but they're both closely related um, to uh, viruses that were detected in the same species, a, a different subspecies of Teropus selecta, black flying foxes, um, in, in Sulawesi in, in Indonesia, which is over four and a half thousand kilometres away. Um, and so the evolutionary history of these, these viruses, how long they've co-evolved with their hosts is, is another really interesting area to look into. Okay. So um, we've been able to, to uh, con um, construct time series um, using a, a sort of novel Bayesian data integration approach that sort of um, brings together data from um, pooled under roof samples and individual samples to look at the dynamics of these six different clades over time. Uh, the clade one and the six in the top and the bottom are really infrequently detected, so there's not too much that we can say there. Um, but the two most common clades, um, which is this four and five, we see this strong um, synchrony of detection um, that tends to be in sort of late, late summer or early uh, autumn um, and consistently year on year. So that, that coincides with um, around the uh, weaning and, and mating periods uh, for this species. But I think we'd be, uh, we need to be cautious about sort of a, um, a lot of studies have found that in coronavirus that it occurs around that time. But by looking at the... Um, different dynamics across the clade, we can see that that's not consistent, uh, that timing is not consistent. We see uh, some infections um, in other clades occurring at other times of the year. We see that um, there is a higher prevalence in, um, of, uh, across all the clades in, in juvenile and subadult um, uh, animals compared to adults. And um, the detection across multiple time points sort of indicate that it's not necessarily the weaning and mating period itself, which is at high risk, but perhaps young individuals um, across, the, across that sort of um, time scale as they're developing, you know, whatever coronavirus is circulating at that time. 
We also see a, saw a really high rate of co-infection. About 13% of the individuals that were infected with coronavirus were actually infected with two or more uh, infection, um, different clays at the same time. Um, and almost all of these were um, juveniles and sub-adults. So this um, synchronous excretion of these two clades, four and five, as combined with the co-infection, um, creates the opportunities for recombination, so which is um, known for, um, for coronaviruses and, um, and hypothesised to be a major driver of viral emergence. And so I'm really excited about this work and um, about developing this into a, a larger program um, in to, to try and understand the ecological drivers of this synchrony, um, both sort of on an um, ecological, uh, sorry, environmental, uh, sorry, evolutionary scale, um, you know, with those other viruses that were um, detected in, in Sulawesi, but also um, in this time series with the, um, you know, here in Australia. So there's like hundreds or thousands of papers looking at the um, entry of SARS coronavirus 2 into human cells, but very, very few studies that are looking at the dynamics in the bat populations, and basically none that have these long-term um, time series of um, across multiple different um, coronavirus clades. Okay, so with that, oh, this is my last slide. I'll leave you with this um, opening of, this, um, of our conclusion uh, from the paper that I mentioned that's coming out later tonight because um, I think it summarises it really nicely. So spillover is an ecological process uh, and in the realm of human health, an ecological problem. So while human health issues arising from spillover events such as outbreaks and pandemics are addressed by epidemiologically, uh, epidemiological and biomedical countermeasures like testing, isolation and, and vaccines, the ecological aspects of spillover necessitate ecological solutions. To date, biomedical countermeasures to treat pandemics have received far more attention than ecological countermeasures. And our goal here has been to highlight the use of targeted ecological interventions as sensible, equitable and efficient methods to prevent pandemics. So uh, thank you very much for, uh, for your attention tonight. Um, I, there's too many people that, uh, for me to thank this, um, in terms of who contributed to this work um, and, yeah, and the funders. Uh, and I'll leave you with this comment from Ian Beveridge in his book on influenza, um, where he concludes in 1977 that the time is right to start looking for ways to prevent future pandemics. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alison. That was just um, fascinating. As an infectious disease person, <laughs> it's like uh, incredible detective work that you're, you know, thinking about the way in which you will, um, you know, literally be crystal balling um, some of the things that we're, we're doing in the future. Um, one of the things I failed to do when I was introducing um, Alison, because I was too excited to get her up here, is to say that she's, of course, currently at Griffith University, um, and uh, we've been super lucky uh, that she's actually coming to join the Sydney School of Veterinary Science. University of Sydney in June. Uh, she's one of the Horizon Fellows. This is a new um, fellowship scheme of the university and it allows uh, someone to have three years of research and then ease their way into teaching and then become a tenured academic. So we're so excited as a school to have someone with this talent and, and these exciting projects. So um, are there any questions for, for Alison? We've got some roving mics. What is the mechanism of shedding? And in the case of Hendra, do horses ingest <coughs> the virus with their food? Thanks, yeah, sorry, I was probably skipped over that in a little bit too little de detail. So um, Hendra virus is excreted in, in urine from flying foxes predominantly. Um, it, you know, it can be detected in a range of other, um, you know, saliva, faeces and things like that, but predominantly urine, so via the kidneys. Um, and we don't know exactly um, how horses are exposed, um, but one of the, I guess, more parsimonious explanations is that they're, through sniffing um, grass or vegetation that's contaminated with the infected urine, are, are breathing the, um, the aerosolized virus in. So, um, but it may, um, depending on the route of exposure, may determine the uh, symptoms that they um, end up exhibiting. Some of the early cases were um, uh, more 
uh, get me this right, uh, respiratory in nature, and, and then we saw sort of emergence of um, uh, neurological um, cases as well. And so, yeah, it might depend on the route of exposure. Thanks, Alison. It was uh, fascinating. Um, Brendan, Casey, um, the, the dumb question, I think it's the, the, sort of an obvious one too, but why bats? Why are they the cause of so many of the viruses? Why not birds, bees, rats, any of the other million species around? Yeah, uh, Im important question and one that's not been, been answered. So I think that there are a couple of different ways to think about it. One, uh, I mean, every, every animal species have, it has a, um, you know, a whole suite of different viruses that they've naturally co-evolved with. So bats, I think we've um, historically had less direct contact with um, than we have do with our domestic animals. We've already gotten all of their major infections and been exposed or developed antibodies or our own versions of them. Um, and so I think there's new pathways through which um, bat viruses are being exposed to us. There's also a tendency um, for bat viruses to be nasty in, in when they spill over into humans and into, into other species. And that's likely because of that um, long co-evolutionary history between the, the bats and the viruses and, and the evolution of, of flight in bats. Uh, bats are the only flying mammals that um, involves changes to the immune system to deal with free radicals and things like that. And so as they've changed with their, their immune system to, to deal with um, with flight, the viruses have co-evolved different ways to get around that, and that leaves the viruses with all sorts of mechanisms that many other mammals just don't have any um, capacity to counteract. There may be virologists in the audience or immunologists who have different perspectives, but yeah. <laughs> uh, thank you for a really great lecture. Um, I was wondering about, in terms of the bats and their numbers and the conservation of the bats. Um, is, are you seeing any uh, correlation with bat numbers and you know, in terms of those roosting and the way that they're now fragmenting? I mean, fruit bats are known to die in massive numbers when we have heat waves and droughts and stuff. Does that correlate at all with the virus work? Uh, so it can be difficult to study because it's hard to um, count bats and know where they all are at any given time and, and things like that. Um, but we think that, um, so two things. One is when the, the roosts are very large, that's usually when they're feeding on very good, um, you know, native habitats, extensive flowering resources. And so, um, uh, so um, traveling and feeding far away from horses and people. So we don't see the spillover. When we, we have done some sampling to look at the viral excretion in those bats um, in nomadic roosts, which are incredibly challenging to, to try and track and study. But it, it looks like there are less viruses within those large populations. You know, I guess the hypothesis is then that the bats are healthier um, and excreting less virus. Um, I guess on the other side, we, we saw that um, figure that I showed in those um, newly formed roosts, which are often um, uh, smaller, particularly in wintertime when there's not good resources to support them, um, elevated uh, excretion of hendrovirus you know, prevalence in those roosts. So, um, it's actually sort of almost the opposite to what most people would expect, thinking, you know, when there's a lot of bats, the, the risk is very high. Um, it's actually probably the other way around. Um, hi, um, my name's Anthea. I work in public health. I was really interested by your model that can predict um, when we might have a winter with a high risk of spillover um, based on food shortage, and it's going to be... Um, maybe this, this winter or maybe next winter, depending on what happens with the winter flowering. I guess I'm wondering what, um, given that sort of modelling, um, what are the um, preparedness things that can be done, but also sort of who are the stakeholders who would receive that sort of output and be responsible for taking action? Yeah, great question, thanks. Um, so in, in a couple of previous years where we were, um, before we'd even, I guess, finalised the, the models completely, um, so in 2017 and, and 2020, when we had this, um, I guess, indication that there might be a high risk of hendrovirus spillover, we um, put together a warning that went out into, um, in the Australian Veterinary Journal to direct it as veterinarians to, you know, I guess, encourage them to take steps to protect themselves, but also talk to their um, uh, horse owners about sort of vaccination or, or steps to prevent the, the risk of um, not spillover. It's, well, um, well, I guess spillover th through, through vaccination, but also contact um, with the horses that might be sick and awareness about calling, calling vets. Um, 
so we've also um, sort of developed, I guess, um, over the last you know five or six years or so, developed relationships with the um, state chief veterinary officers, and so usually uh, like constantly communicating our research finding and our expectations through them, who then disseminate that through um, you know federal veterinary associations and then through um, you know onto public health and, and things like that. But so sometimes there's warnings that go out to um, uh, registered veterinarians. Um, but yeah, whether that sort of, how much that gets into the more of the public health sphere, um, I think is probably a, a, a little bit uh, less systematic. We've got one more question here. Thank you very much uh, for, for the speech tonight. Um, just a question, how long does the virus generally live outside the host? I mean, is there a time frame for once the, um, the bats ex excreted the virus, how long does it live? Is it a horse coming along to sniff or other animals? Yeah, so um, from uh, so some controlled experiments being done in, in lab environments that, you know, if the conditions are right, it could be, um, to, you know, 24 hours or, or so, I think, from memory. Um, but I think in, in reality, um, it's, it's a number of hours. So it depends on the humidity, whether I guess the, the grass is moist with dew or not. Um, do you know how cold, how warm or cold the ambient temperature is, whether it's in direct UV sunlight or not. And so um, certainly, do you know, throughout the day um, after, you know, um, after the bat has been sort of perhaps feeding in a tree in a horse property overnight would be, um, would be a risk period. Yeah, my question was about uh, different bat species. Um, so everything that you've presented is about um, flying foxes, but of course there's a whole other set of bats, which are the insectivorous bats. Um, so some of those have um, roosting behaviour in which you would see large quantities of uh, individuals together, but not all of them do. So my question is, are the sort of disease dynamics different between um, species and and in particular uh, is that a feature of animals that live in large population groups uh, so two two short answers and then I'll elaborate firstly I know very little about um, little bats <laughs> um, but yes we would expect obviously with that changing ecology to, to the virus dynamics to be different so I think in, in terms of um, the ecology of, of microbats, insectivorous bats, um, I think we'd be looking at um, trying to understand the, the virus dynamics at those times when they do con congregate together for, you know, for mating and, and um, maternity roosts and, and things like that, um, with the expectation that that would be very different when they're, um, you know, outside of those periods. But yeah, there's been very, very little work done um, uh, in terms of viral surveillance in um, outside of flying foxes, basically. No, it can be either. So, um, so Hendra, Nipah virus, for example, Ebola. You know, um, those are mostly uh, tend to be in, in fruit bat species. Um, you know, here in Australia and um, uh, in Asia and, and, and Africa. But uh, coronaviruses, are, and particularly those coronaviruses that are um, highly pathogenic in, in humans, are much more likely to be detected in, in microbat species, flying loafers species, for example. Yeah. Got a question here. Are bats required for the pollination of those pulses, which cause such a, which have such a significant effect over spillovers on spillovers? Uh, yes, is the, the short answer to that. I'll <laughs> careful of what I say. There's um, Peggy, who's in the audience here, who knows a lot more about it. But yes, they. Um, I mean, if you see photos of bats after they've been feeding on these uh, eucalypt species, they are completely covered on their face with pollen. And then we have documented um, through GPS tracking some of these bats that are travelling, um, you know, feeding in one night, travelling hundreds of kilometres, roosting in another location, and then going back again, the, you know, in a, in a subsequent night. And so that. 
through that capability, they're able to not only pollinate those species, that the trees that they're feeding on, but over really large distances to um, connect those fragmented um, pockets um, of habitat that sort of, you know, birds and insects just can't span that same distance. So, yeah, they're critical for that pollination. Great, thank you so much. Uh, if I can just, oh, Cass will get cranky with me, but I'll just ask you one more question. Um, and that is, um, a lot of people who do research into bats um, are a range of different discipline experts, virology and everything like that. You have the added thing of being a veterinarian. So can I ask you what your, a, and bats themselves have been demonized from you know vampire movies and horrors and lots of things. And now they, they have a lot of viruses that could kill us. Mm -hmm. We saw COVID uh, have people turned their attention even to their own dog in their home as a suspect of something that might transmit to them. What's your attitude towards bats? I love bats. <laughs> so, um, I came to, to researching bat viruses for my PhD um, out of an interest for the viruses because it was just as, um, you know, some of these new emerging vi uh, viruses were emerging and it was a hot topic, it was very interest uh, interesting. But I've always had an interest and a passion in, in wildlife and once I started studying these bats, although I knew very little about them to start off with, they're just addictively kind of fascinating and so, yeah, I can't imagine moving on. <laughs> Having read your CV, I figured that was going to be your answer, so that's <laughs> how I wanted to end it. Yeah, okay. <laughs> so, uh, thank you. If we could thank Alison for her amazing talk. <laughs> and if I could invite you for food and drinks at the top of the stairs. Thank you so much for coming today.